This summer, a divided nation came together over an astronomical phenomenon. Collectively, the country donned dark glasses and looked skyward to the sun to observe the solar eclipse. I'm Dan Patterson for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and today we look to the sun for another reason for power. Megastructures known as Dyson Spheres or Dyson Swarms sound like science fiction and far future tech, and they are. But innovations that harness the power of the sun are here today, and solar tech is getting better all the time. With me today is physicist Isaac Arthur to discuss how the sun could power human and alien civilizations. Isaac, thanks a ton for your time. I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel that we'll link to in the story coupled with this video. Um, but let's let's start instead of starting small and and near future tech let's let's go to the far future and define what dyson spheres what dyson swarms are and then we'll kind of go on a path that could lead us there oh, sure dan uh, glad to be back on uh, the basic concept for a dyson sphere is the idea that most stars produce about a billion times more energy than is actually hitting any given planet so since all that energy is basically going to waste and energy is what drives civilizations, you probably want to capture that. There are some alternatives, such as just taking the star apart and using that for fuel in your own fusion reactors. But the basic notion is that you would enclose a star, not in a hard shell as often gets portrayed in science fiction, but with a swarm of power satellites and other things that will soak up that energy and let you use it for purposes you want rather than letting it just go off into space. And uh, so it is often seen uh, from a futurism point of view that most civilizations should do something like this, and that should be a lot easier to see than the scene for radio waves. So the, uh, the Dyson sphere or Dyson swarm concept is very important for looking for what are called Kardashev two scale objects, um, which should be visible galaxies away rather than just maybe 100 light years like a radio signal. I'm glad you mentioned that uh, Dyson Spheres, Dyson Swarms were recently in the news uh, with Tabby's star. Uh, this is a star where uh, astronomers found it was dimming by a certain percentage over the last century. We'll link to the study in the story for this post. Now, it's pretty likely that Tabby's star is not a Dyson Swarm because there's all kinds of other reasons from astronomical debris to comets that a star could dim, but it did bring the idea into the mainstream. Uh, but the idea has been around for a long time. Isaac, where did uh, the idea of a Dyson Swarm begin? Well, that's actually interesting is, is the term comes from Freeman Dyson, uh, who was a student of Richard Feynman, uh, who came up with a lot of the mega structural concepts. But it actually goes back before that to a sci-fi writer named Olaf Stapleton, who did a lot of writing in the, in the 30s. Uh, I think the book he was in with that was Stallmaker. Uh, but Dyson's the one who developed the concept more thoroughly and for whom it's named. Uh, and I, would say, I want to say that was the 1960s, but don't quote me on that. Uh, they've also been used in video games and in movies and in pop culture. Uh, Star Trek is one of my favorite examples. Uh, but what would it take? I, I mean, the idea of surrounding a star to harness its energy sounds like science fiction. What would it take for a civilization to build a megastructure? Well, this is the, the tricky part about this is that we often see it as this hard shell, often with people on the inside, uh, like a underground planet. Um, but that's never been the, the idea in mind. What we would usually talk about doing is using just a basic power satellite, you know, solar panels and a bit of a control mechanism in orbit around the sun. And they might be a few meters across or a few hundred meters across. And what you're doing isn't making one big shell but making you know, trillions of these things, along with other structures such as rotating habitats like an O'Neill cylinder, which can be uh, made out of steel, you know, many kilometers long, or made out of something like graphene, uh, that carbon allotrope that uh, is, you know, everyone likes for space elevators, could potentially be the size of a continent. And um, you would have a, probably a mixture of these being used for any number of purposes. You could have rotating habitats that were suburban you know, settlements, uh, cities, nature preserves, because they're nicely enclosed. Um, so you have to worry about them being tinkered with. 
or others where they're just big power collectors that soak up energy and turn it into computer processing power. Uh, I think we even came up with the idea that you could use it to store it inside Kugelblitz black holes. If you don't need all that power, and this is the usual objection to a Dyson sphere is, what do you do with all that energy? You could just store it for future use. Um, and so it's not hard to build one, obviously trying to use it to make black holes a little bit higher tech, but uh, it's not hard to build them. We have the technology to do it now. It's just we don't have the infrastructure and space to do it. And you don't build it all at once. You'd start off with, say, moon bases and some satellites around Earth, and you just kind of keep expanding that, adding elements as you need and as you have the resources for, until eventually you enclose your star and get all the energy from it. Why would a civilization, this may be kind of a rhetorical question, but why would a civilization need that much power other than to store it? You could understand why you might need future power, but if the intent was to use the power now, uh, what kind of civilization would need that much energy? Well, we specifically named that a Kardashev II civilization, uh, but what they, you know, in terms of what tech they would have for that, it kind of depends. Um, again, they could just be making fake planets, thin, rotating habitats, and then they just use that for a much bigger population. They would have a system population of 10 billion billion instead of 10 billion. But there's a lot of other things you could use this for. Uh, one of them is you could actually run transmutation with this. Fusion, turning hydrogen to helium or helium into carbon, is one of those things that normally produces energy, and we have problems doing that ourselves to produce energy but it's very easy to do it if you don't mind putting a ton of power into it. So if you've got an entire star to work with and lots of excess energy, you can make heavier elements that you might use for construction. Uh, the other obvious thing, you know, running computers, but you can use it as a freebie for interstellar travel. Even if you don't have um, any handy compact fusion or really good starships or any warp travel, things like that, you can use laser beams to push on things. And uh, it's actually one of the best ways to accelerate a ship up past basic relativistic speeds. Um, you hit it from behind with a laser, it's got a big view on the back, and you just keep hitting it with an intense laser until it's up to speed. When it gets to its destination, it can break in various ways, hopefully with another laser on the other side. Um, but you can use this for in-system travel. You can use this to you know, uh, send ships up to highly relativistic speeds to other solar systems. So any civilization that has the ability to make one of these and has one, even part of one in place, does have interstellar travel because they can beam the energy out to that, you know, that ship. Um, and obviously try to keep it focused for given value of focused is pretty tricky and probably requires relay stations. Um, but it is an alternative to uh, fission power, which we do have, and can, you know, uh, contain fusion power, which we don't. Uh, hopefully we will have that soon, but you know you can't be guaranteed we will get that. So the Dyson sphere is the ultimate way around that. We know we can build solar panels, we know we can build satellites, and we know we can build lasers. So yeah, so I, I'm actually glad that you mentioned present tech. It I think maybe one of the reasons Dyson swarms are in the news recently because it's almost tantalizingly close. Like many of these technologies are in, in uh, process now and the materials are pretty common materials. Can you tell me about the technology that's here and, and used on earth that would be used in a megastructure? Well, there's obviously you have the ability to use basic materials like steel. The problem is, um, and of course, if you're working in zero gravity, you can build almost as big as you want with any material. But when you start putting that under spin, if you want to create artificial gravity by centrifugal force, then you need stronger materials. The circumference of an object like that can't exceed basically what you can build a suspension bridge out of uh, in terms of length. So what we will, you know, it's nice to be able to make these steel structures like the Neosone are dreadfully expensive, but graphene, again, everyone's favorite new material, graphene, doesn't just let you make ones that are a few kilometers across. It makes you make ones that are pretty close to the planetary scale if you want to. Um, twin to that, you know, as we get better with superconductors and if we can get around the magnetic interference issue, um, you can make some very strongly supported active structures, as we call them, uh, which is where you start being able to replace um, traditional compressive or tensile strength issues with something that's basically pushing out the entire time. 
uh, sort of like holding something up with a piece of paper over an air vent. Um, and these allow us to potentially make some truly ridiculous structures in terms of size and what they do. Uh, what was it? The Analemma Tower, the floating one that hung down, uh, was in the news like two months ago they designed. Uh, not a good idea in of itself, but you can use things like active support to make things like that. Um, though I'm not quite sure why you would want to build that specific thing. <laughs> yeah. Are there are there companies that you're aware of uh, that are working on some of these problems? Uh, it seems kind of crazy, but when we look at what Elon Musk and what Jeff Bezos are, are doing, they aren't just creating space companies, they're creating markets of the future. Uh, so are there, are there other companies that you are aware of that are working on solving problems? Uh, I know Tethers. I know Tethers Unlimited has been looking at the issue of using them. And, uh, you know, we have this issue with space elevators. We don't really have a material, even graphene, if we can mass produce it, that's quite good enough for a space elevator. But there's a lot of other applications like skyhooks or just uh, power generation with Tethers that you can do with a lot of these newer materials. Um, you know, they're not necessarily strong enough for a space elevator. And uh, Tethers Unlimited is one of the companies I know that, that's been working that angle for a while. I'm trying to think of who else does, but it, it tends to be tends to be mostly on your own time. Uh, you know, engineers look at these problems, talk to each other about them on the internet, and uh, maybe there's somebody has one on a conference as a topic. But I don't think too many companies are actually funding research into uh, the construction of a Dyson sphere. Our satellites, though, of course, are something people have been looking at for a while, but I cannot think at the moment of the name of the one company that does it. And I, I know there are others too. So. Um, power satellites, obviously, always an issue. Um, if you can get the power generated up in space, there's no clouds. There's actually more light up there, which is problematic in some respects. Uh, and then you beam it down with, uh, with um, microwaves or some other source to a, a power plant. Um, this has some options to it, but people often ask with a Dyson Swarm is, if you've got all that power, are you beaming that back to Earth? And, of course, the answer is no. We have a device designed to aim lasers at, at one planet. Uh, it's called a Nico Dyson beam. It's a death star. <laughs> it <laughs> Take all the sun's energy and aim it right at the Earth, and, and you will, of course, blow the thing up. And it will actually take about a week, though. Um, it's not instantaneous. Um, but uh, you, know, you use that power up in space. And a lot of the uh, developments that you would make for things like this aren't so much about what you can do down on Earth with them, but building up that infrastructure in space and slowly moving less to colonizing planets as we often see in the future, but more of most people live in these kind of artificial habitats in space. For Earth, of course, the big one is um, if you really want to increase the amount of energy you can use on Earth, you have to start deploying these things not to absorb sunlight, uh, but to reflect it away. And you say, well, we're going to make much higher power generation on Earth by fusion reactors or beaming it in from power satellites. You've got to get rid of that heat. <laughs> and uh, that means shading the planet to some degree. With the, with the eclipse, actually, we were talking about the oil is um, most people won't even notice an eclipse is happening unless it gets above a certain percentage. Oh, I just aren't sensitive enough for it. But you'll notice um, when it's going on, when it's approaching, the lighting doesn't seem right because it's too much of a noontime light. The shadows are too sharp uh, and the color is not evening light, so it's too dim. It seems a bit off. But otherwise, you don't really notice any difference because um, you can't look up there at the sun. And of course, if you put little shades the size of football stadiums in front of the sun, you won't be able to tell other than it's just got a little bit dimmer. And there are frequencies of light that uh, we don't even see, like infrared, that make up the majority of what the sun sends at us. So if you have to really worry about a planet overheating, either from global warming or artificially boosted global warming when you're beaming energy in through fusion reactors and, and power-based satellites, you can increase how many people you can support on the planet and how much energy you can bring in by shading the planet just a little bit so that nobody notices and block out the less useful frequencies we can't even see, like infrared. Um, Isaac Arthur is a physicist. You can learn more at IsaacArthur.net. And I encourage you to follow his YouTube channel, which examines very similar topics. We'll link to it in the text story for this video. Arthur, Isaac, I, I appreciate your time. I have one last question for you. And it kind of, it, it looks to the future and asks an existential question about our existence. Uh, when we look at Dyson spheres, the amount of energy that they radiate would be observable 
by us with current technology now. We haven't seen a Dyson sphere uh, in our observations of the universe. So this kind of raises questions about the Fermi paradox and, and the not just a uh, future of human civilization, but raises the question, are we alone? Isaac, why have we not observed? A Dyson sphere seems like a very common or very, almost any technological civilization could think of this because you're surrounded by stars. The power is there and it's abundant. So why have we not observed uh, uh, other uses of Dyson spheres throughout the universe? This is, this is the, the fundamental Dyson dilemma that you get off of uh, the, the same halt and typical conjectures for the Fermi paradox. If there's a lot of life out there and it's expansionist and wants to do what, what we would tend to want to do, get out there, explore and colonize, and they're building all of these things, then you should see big chunks of galaxies a billion light years away and a billion years back in time disappearing as they just not just Dyson their own sun, but other ones nearby it. We could miss a Dyson sphere of one by itself in our own galaxy pretty easily, and we miss one another galaxy quite easily. It's more the idea that they're just going to keep doing it. Every star they get to will eventually become a Dyson sphere. And the dilemma you get from this is very obviously nobody is doing that. So either there's a reason why you wouldn't want to build these, and we can't really think of any, or then probably the more likely is that there just aren't any aliens this close to us. And when we say this close to us, it's not just in our galaxy, it's more like our supercluster. That they haven't evolved yet anywhere we can see, and uh, you know maybe if you look two billion light years out, there's somebody there that evolved after that, because it takes two billion years for light to get here. But fundamentally, it just doesn't look like there's anybody not just in all galaxy, but you know, for thousands around us. Well, that's incredibly reassuring, Isaac. Let's. <laughs> let's you're worried about alien invasions, yes. <laughs> so the gray filter is still in front of us. We will, of course, be the first civilization to develop Dyson swarms. Again, IsaacArthur.net uh, for more on megastructures, Dyson spheres, the Fermi paradox, and future technology. And to read more, at ZDNet and Tech Republic, I'm Dan Patterson.